1976, producer Philip Hinchcliffe commissioned writer Chris Boucher to create a futuristic Eliza Doolittle character in the Doctor Who story, The Face of Evil. Boucher named the character Leela after the famous Palestinian terrorist, Leela Khaled. After extensive auditions, Hinchcliffe chose actress Louise Jameson to play the savage warrior woman from the future. Since Doctor Who, Louise has enjoyed an illustrious television career, appearing in various series such as Tenko and EastEnders, and we had the rare opportunity to chat with her at the United FanCon convention in 1998. Um, we're talking with Louise Jameson, who starred in the 70s alongside Tom Baker in Doctor Who, and currently has a part in EastEnders, a BBC soap opera. And we'd just like to uh, talk to you about your experiences and find out what's going on with you these days. Okay. Louise, thank you. I'm ready. Yeah, uh, first what I'd like to ask is, um, what were your preparations for Leela? I know you that you said that, um, I think you had a story that you watched your dog or something to get the, the mannerisms and the sort of, you know, always watching and, and, the, um, and the movements and that kind of thing. I, although Leela was uh, uneducated, I didn't want to make her stupid. Mm -hmm. So I looked around for creatures that were uneducated and intelligent, and I settled on two. One was my dog, who's no longer with us, sadly. Mm -hmm. And the other was the little girl who lived upstairs, uh, called Sally. Highly intelligent, but of course, hadn't gone through any kind of education. So there I was with these two as my role models. I only use little things, like a twist of the head when I heard something, you know, that the dog, the holding of the breath, which is kind of animal instinctive qualities. I also wanted to, not to have an accent, but to have slightly, slightly careful speech. So I took out all the apostrophes, so instead of wasn't, I'd go was not, couldn't, could not. So it was just slightly studied the way she spoke, slightly archaic. I figured that if the Sever team had crashed that long ago, then something of an archaic language would have stayed, would have descended down to her generation, so that was that was why I made that choice. Mm -hmm. And um, I know people have said Tom Baker was difficult to work with, <laughs> um, and I know he didn't like the character of Leela when it first started out, but you said that you admired his professionalism and how it actually played, and I guess that's something I've always admired in watching the show is just, the, like, both Tom and you are just totally on top of things, it's just, you know, you're playing it totally straight, and that's... And I, I always love the way that, you know, when he was off doing, you know, well, we've got this over here. You were like, you know, because you're supposed to be a savage, you're like looking at a, you know, a piece of something you had never seen before. And I always love that. Um, it's a very Stanislavski approach I have to, to all of my work, big like Shakespeare or Noel Coward or mm -hmm. indeed uh, Doctor Who. It's something that, what would this character want out of this moment? What is my objective? There is, it's like life. You, you always have a want, like I want to communicate to you now, and you always have an obstacle, and my obstacle is that perhaps I'm not explaining myself properly, therefore I'll try to do it very clearly. Do you see what I mean? So mm -hmm. that it's a very direct desire in everything you do, and I think Leela's overriding desire to learn, she was like a piece of sponge or a piece of blotting paper, she just was thirsty for knowledge, you know, and I think that's... Uh, one of the exciting things about playing with her. When the writer had that in mind as well, like Bob Holmes was my favorite writer, when he had that knowledge that, that that's what Leela wanted and that desire was fed into whatever adventure we were in, that was terrific. When I was written just as an assistant, you know, that could have been that's Mary right, Lodge, right. Sarah Jane, or, you know, who, whoever, when, when, the, when the speeches become interchangeable between us and not enough thoughts gone into the actual character development. That's right. That's that's something they they often do lot, lose in Doctor Who is what is the companion's motivation? Exactly. Why it's usually she, but you know why he or she going into the TARDIS, you know, and doing something which is really amazing. But actually, it occurred to me actually this weekend when we were doing a panel on your era that the motivation of Leela actually in a way sort of made sense that because she was used to you know mystical things and fabulous concepts that the idea of the TARDIS being larger on the inside. 
than the outside. You know, it wouldn't be so mind blowing because oh, it's just the gods. You know. That's a lovely scene, though, isn't it? Where he tries to explain, yeah. and he takes it away, and well, you go into yeah. the whole perspective, and things go like. <laughs> I really like that scene. I wish there had been more of that. Actually. Yeah, you know, even the, in the bit where you're playing with the um, yo-yo is great too. It's like because you're like, when can I stop, Doctor? And he's, uh, aren't you having fun? <laughs> yeah. How much of the uh, character did you have input into? I mean, was a lot of the, the director telling you to go off and do something like that, or did you have a say in where you think it should go? Well, it, it depended very much on the director. Really, usually, because my knowledge of Lila became greater than anybody else's, normally what I said went. Right. On, on the other hand, as an assistant, you do have to be pretty accommodating. It's not like I was the driving force right. making the decisions. Because um, on shows over here, for instance, Star Trek, Star Trek The Next Generation, yeah. people like Michael Dorn have told stories about how when they were on the show, they would have input about their own character, and they'd be doing things they didn't think the character should do. And, and they try giving ideas, and they'd always refuse to listen to them. And eventually, they just gave up and just let let it go. And no, I, I think the BBC were more accommodating, but it was a pretty lengthy process. If you wanted a line change, for example, you'd tell the director, who'd tell the producer, who'd get hold of the executive producer, who would then phone the writer, who would then call the executive producer, come back to the producer, the director. So you had to go through that chain of command. It wasn't mm -hmm. just the director had his say after he got a suggestion from Not you. Not really. You kind of learn to work the system. <coughs> You know, occasionally you might go in on the day and just go, oh, I've just had a thought about this line, so that you could sidestep the paraphernalia. Or a, a, a request that you thought might be rejected, then it was, yeah. then it, you just had to be quite careful about who you asked and when you asked. Or maybe you'd ask for ten different things and the one you really wanted you'd push for the most. <laughs> yes, all right, well, I'll forget like the that, other right? two years, something like so. that. But I did, I was very uh, emphatic, is that the right word? I really didn't want to. Yeah. Uh, scream. I really didn't want to turn into a... Well, not Scream, but David Jansen, who starred in The Fugitive years ago, once said that, ask for everything you can think of and maybe you'll get half if you're oh, lucky. So, that was his philosophy. I thought he was a wonderful actor. I yeah. really like that series. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. <laughs> well, another thing I love from your era is, as you say, the writers, um, like Robert Holmes and Chris Boucher, yes. I think that, that did the best for your character. Yes, Chris as well. I don't want to yeah. forget him. That uh, even well, your character did have you know so sort of witty comebacks and stuff, particularly like in Robots of Death, um, you know, kicking um, Yuvanov and stuff, and uh, saying me saying something like, um, "Well, uh, why shouldn't I have you killed?" And you said, and "Then you say, well, you must have a good reason, otherwise you have done it." And so I thought. Uh, Definitely, that uh, in their stories there was more, you know, focus on the actual character of Leela, um, and the character of Leela was presented as someone who just used straight, direct, head-on logic yeah. in your face yeah. of like, you know, well, no okay. manipulation, just who she was. Yeah, yeah. she said what she Very thought, and yeah. you know, dealt with other characters. That yeah, way. I really liked that. I mean, I, I did love Leela, and I loved uh, uh, Blanche and Tenko for similar reasons, and the character I'm playing now. Rosa DeMarco in EastEnders, which I understand is going to come to this area quite soon. How did you feel the way about the uh, character was written out? I mean, it was kind of weak for her. <laughs> How Lila was written out? BBC's way of getting rid of a woman, you know, make her fall in love, right? Would you have continued to do it, or were you busy doing something else that you I wanted to go into? I had taken a very deliberate career decision to leave the series. I, was, I didn't want to stay in it too long, and I had been offered a Porsche in A Merchant of Venice at Bristol Old Vic, so it was a marvellous opportunity, which I grabbed with both hands and a very good experience. I think in retrospect, I would, uh, John Nathan Turner asked me to go back in for a season, and I said that I would go back in for maybe two or three stories, but I didn't want to do a whole season. Right. And I think in retrospect that that was a mistake. I would like to have done another season. Now. But, mm -hmm. you know, c'est la vie. There's always <laughs> one that gets away. Mm -hmm. That's true. What were you going to say about EastEnders? That, that how much I love the character, you know, she's the character I play, she's Cockney working class, she's a really passionate, she's really passionate about her kids, which is something that I can relate to very yeah. strongly, and she's a single parent.